Welcome to this episode of the Comedy Defects Podcast. My name is Winter, I'm a comedian, and this is my show. Those that are new to the show, welcome. Those that are old to the show, welcome back, guys. Now, this episode is episode 90. I recorded it, we recorded for an hour and 50, I've cut it down to an hour and a half. So this intro is going to be very short. It is with the excellent comedian Jay Handley. He looks a little bit like Jesus, he's from the Midlands, and he talked about in this podcast about how his set isn't really competition style. Anyway, he got through his heat for English Comedian of the Year 2021, so fair play to him. He plays all the major clubs, store, top secret, all the big ones around the country, and more. So if you ever see him on a bill, go and check him out. He's got his show, White Jesus, on his website, which is www.jhandley.com. He's an excellent comedian. And you can find this podcast. We're on Facebook. We're there. We have a page. You can go to Twitter. You can follow me at Winter Dominus. I'm also on Instagram at Winter Dominus as well. That's Winter, D-O-M-I-N-U-S. Now, if you like this podcast enough and you feel like you want to donate, just go to Patreon, type in The Comedy Defects Podcast. I'll donate as little or as much as you feel this podcast is worth. And if you can't donate, that's okay. Just tell your friends about your favorite episode or go to the podcast app and leave us a nice, honest review because it tells people where we are and what we're up to. So as I say, I'm going to keep this intro short. So this is Jay Handley for episode 90. Enjoy. Jay, how have you been, man? What have you been up to? How's everything going for you? Oh, well, I've been so busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No joke there. Start us off. Nice. Um, no, I, um, I've, I've been all right, you know, yeah. as far as it goes. Uh, during the pandemic, I um, made a very early decision right at the start uh, to buy an Xbox. Nice. And, uh, and then spent a considerable amount of time playing computer games and ignoring the rest of the world. It seemed to work quite well. You know, intermittent bits of writing here and there, you know, mm. uh, to sort of, sort of maintain the illusion that I'm still a comedian yeah. <laughs> in some form. Yeah. But apart from that, yeah, just uh, just having a as a, as nice a time as you can of it. I mean, one thing comedians will never get is holidays, really, uh, by the nature of the job, because you kind of just got to do what gigs you can. And so, having an enforced period of time off uh, is something I think to be to be embraced. Uh, more than anything uh, so that's what I tried to do and what was the games you were playing on the Xbox oh a whole range I am um, mm. Warzone has been a consistent one throughout Call of Duty sort of thing yeah Call of Duty yeah yeah yeah. just first person shooter mm. uh, battle royale thing nice which, uh, I play with uh, a few chums uh, Gareth Berlina who you might know comedian mm. yeah and, uh, and a normie called uh, Adam who's a normal human being who right. exists in the real world and then interspersed from that, like, that's been a consistent game. I played a lot, and then uh, I've just like clocked a bunch of other games. Like I did Red Dead Redemption, mm. Doom One and Two, like Doom and Doom Eternal. I did uh, uh, Dishonored Two. Play that, right? Uh, you know, uh, this is a computer games podcast. No, it? I mean, I mean, I'm I'm a big gamer. I, I was an Xbox <laughs> guy before before anything else. I mean, like mm. PlayStation, then Xbox, and then. Yeah, yeah. Um, then back to PlayStation because I was like, I'm not paying a monthly subscription. No. And then... You're not? No. Well, a monthly subscription? No, like you did on the um, Xbox. Isn't it? You have like a monthly subscription Oh, to... Xbox Live. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Mm. So here's what I got for my subscription. Just mm. to big up the Xbox well, yeah. while I get a chance. You know, Bill Gates needs <laughs> all the help he can get at these troubled times. This is very um, true. Very you true. know, he's probably taken a bit of a hit. I got my mate told me about this. I don't think you can do it anymore. Mm. But there's this thing where, you, okay, so you need Xbox Live to play online with an Xbox. And so I bought uh, three years of that because there's this, there was this thing going on where you, I don't know if you've heard of Xbox Game Pass, which is like a Netflix of computer games, for mm. those who don't know. Loads of really good games on it, actually. It basically had this deal going where if you paid one pound for Xbox Game Pass, yeah. it would automatically upgrade your Xbox Live membership to Xbox Game Pass. Nice. And so for three years of Xbox Live, I paid one pound and upgraded it all to three years of Game Pass. So for like whatever it works out, is like 120 quid. I've got three years of loads of free games. And nice. Xbox Live. So it actually works out pretty well. But I've been an Xbox person since the first one. I was a, like an early adopter. And, uh, <laughs> and then I got well into Halo. That was my favorite game. So it's always been Xboxes for me. Well, okay, we'll start from the very beginning here. Let's go the the yeah, chronology yeah, of the whole thing. That. Game Boy, Commodore sixty four, yeah, yeah. 
and like the, the old one with like just you know monochrome uh yeah, yeah, yeah. and then like and then so, boy i remember oh that. mega man as well yeah. you know mega man and, and oh, yeah, like yeah, of course yeah. mario of course we always had to have that one too and Tet- tetris yeah, yeah. standard but tetris like great, yeah. uh, you'd have so those and then Commodore 64 and uh, had a game on there called exterminator and it was like the longest game i think it had something ridiculous like 200 and something levels they were like huh. they were i mean you know you're trying to get through them you're like you know it's all on tape as well for the c64 yeah, yeah. and you're like okay i'm trying to get to the the next thing just please don't crash because i'll have to reload everything and find <laughs> the counter it was so complicated you know you remember how harsh games used to be oh god yeah like i had games when i was a kid that basically i could do like the first five minutes of them and then they were just too difficult for a child to enjoy yeah like and they, they were just ruthless they were like yeah if you can't do it then go fuck yourself you can never play this game whereas nowadays it's like you can play on easy mode or whatever and it's just a walk in the park but the games back then you know you had to actually work hard to be yeah unless you really play like have you played god of war I have not. I the third one. Oh, one man, it is. It's amazing. And yeah. like, as you're saying there, you know, now it's like, you know, they, they make it so hard that in some places that you just go, no, mm-hmm. fuck off, mate. You're not good enough for this bit yet. <laughs> and like, this it's such a great game. You're like, oh, brilliant. It's a bit like, you know, you are Conan and it's got Christopher Judge as the voice for the main character. And like, oh, okay. which one's he? Christopher it, Judge. He is the guy from, from um, Stargate, Teal'c. I do you remember Stargate. From when I was a young, a young child. Yeah, the main guard who was like, you know, king of the. Uh, well, not, was he like their their kind of knockoff Klingon? Yeah, he was right, exactly yeah, the yeah, big yeah. the Stargate's fucking knockoff Klingon. That's him. That was him. He was like, yeah. you know, very sort of like kind of calm and just like, you know, yes, Mister Anderson, sort of like, you know, yeah, really yeah, just yeah. sort of just chilled out and just a badass, you know, like don't. don't he was our BA basically, but with <laughs> a kind of like, you know, um, more 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 words. I can't remember why we were talking about Stargate. <laughs> I don't know, mate, but like, no, because it, basically the the voice, his voice, right? He, he does the voice oh, for yeah, so he's many. Oh yeah, God of War. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, I mean, you're right, an, okay. you're an audio yeah. file, right? You're an audio file, and like you kind of like yeah, you, you know, do you do, do you do do you do voiceovers as well? <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, 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 that's very kind of you to even imagine that I could. Um, I hope I, I don't know what I, I hate whenever I hear my voice on anything. I'm like, ugh, that's gross. I assume your you're, listeners you're... are all listening. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh, I can't bear the sound of this man's horrible voice. Uh, you've got a brilliant radio voice. I was, I thought, I was like, am I on a radio or a podcast? I can't tell anymore. Oh, uh, stop it. Go your, on. Your voice is so <laughs> superbly uh, radiophonic. When I come off, though, I just go go back to revert back to West Cork and talk really quickly, and it all becomes one word, you know. Audiogenic, but, that's what you are. Ah, nice. That's nice. That's yeah. a new. That's a new phrase. I like that's that one. Phrase. I'm having that one. I'm going to put good. that on a poster. I'm going to put that on a yeah, poster. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Audiogenic. Audiogenic. <laughs> you take a really good sound bite. Yeah. You, so you're from Birmingham, right? I am. Okay, you're right. You don't like the sound of your own voice, but if you could choose a voice. Whose voice would you choose? Uh, any voice. It would probably be like Scottish or something. I really oh, like yeah? Scottish voices. Oh. Um, they're really cool. Like yeah, Glaswegian? Yeah. Like Glaswegian or something? Or? Maybe not Glaswegian. Maybe Edinburgh, I prefer. No yeah. offence to the Ouija's or anything. Yeah. But uh, they, they, they're like the Scousers of Scotland, aren't they? The Ouija's. Uh, whereas the Edinburghians are kind of more, you know, the, the sort of the Southern Irish of, of Scotland. They, like Southern Ireland as well. That's lovely, isn't it? It's like so, just like, a lilt, oh, isn't it, really? You know, what some... listening to now, it's like, oh, I shouldn't say Southern <laughs> Island, though. I've made that mistake before. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've made that. I remember so I said there's a little clip of me on Instagram actually mm. making this mistake on my uh, Instagram where I said, oh, are you from Northern Ireland or Southern Ireland? And the guy just went, well, we just call it Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Put, That's me true. Yeah. Put me in my place. Yeah. my place. Div- dividing already. Yes, I just want to That's know exactly it. where you're from. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, you know, yeah, yeah. like, I mean, you're from the Midlands, so you're right in the Midlands. Does it, you know, you're mm. just dead centre, right? Is Mosley? Is it Mosley? Um, it's uh, it's Mosley. King's Heath is King's where Heath, I sorry. grew up, which is right next to Mosley, which is kind of like the trendy area of Birmingham. And King's Heath is right next to it. And mm. it's like less trendy, but still all right. But then there's the, the people who live between King's Heath and Mosley. A lot of King's Heath people mm. try and pretend that they live in Mosley. Okay. I think it gives them some sort of cachet. Uh, the, always the uh, way in it. The, yeah. the rent's more in that place, you know, so they want to be from exactly, there. Yeah, it's so yeah, ridiculous, yeah. like, right? Yeah. Oh, man. So you grew up there and, uh, like, you uh, were you always into comedy, Jay? I was, yeah. I, I really liked it. I never was into the idea of being a comedian. Or at least I was, but I never thought it was possible. Mm. But I was. I really loved comedy. I remember the first 
I think the thing that really got me into it was I went on a, a school trip and uh, my mum said a present before the trip and I got a um, an audio cassette recording of um, Billy Connolly's world tour of Australia. Brilliant. And uh, that was sort of, it had bits of his stand up and bits of him just talking about kangaroos or whatever. And uh, oh, it was fucking so funny. I just remember from then just being like, what a brilliant thing to do. Mm. So always then from then on was like trying to be funny all the time. But when it came to comedians, I always just assumed because I was an idiot, they didn't write material and stuff or have to work at being comedians and instead just like blew an hour of hilarious stuff out their asses every time they got on stage. And so I thought, oh, you can't do that. It's impossible. Yeah. Only magic people can do that. So I didn't think of doing comedy until I was older. For me, like, like, because I've lived in, I lived in the um, Midlands for quite a while, actually. Oh, wow. Um, and, Whereabouts? Uh, Wolverhampton. Uh, you know, <laughs> so I was like in Poor uh... cousin of Birmingham. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah. I'm like you try to like big yourself up. I'm like I'm bigging myself. I'm just knocking myself right down. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I lived in Wolverhampton for about maybe seven years, man. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I I really liked it, man. But I I found that people were just like when you go there, people are really friendly and like that kind of that kind of what you're saying there is like I never you never thought people could do it only the magic people like who yeah, who yeah, had these things people, about yeah. them who were just born that way had yeah, that yeah. kind of root and I think that the Midlands has suffers that same thing as um like the, the Celtic sort of thing is where you kind of go oh no I just couldn't do that you know I, I just <laughs> keep you stay in your place you know don't don't, don't, don't we're, don't we're a very humble people yeah Birmingham I, I was talking to my girlfriend about this recently it's like we are the, the Midlands in general you don't hear anything about us being proud yeah. of where we're from. Like Scousers, mm-hmm. Manx and that, they're so fucking proud yeah. of being from Liverpool. Oh, yeah, fucking amazing. Yeah. Or Manchester. Oh, we're so great. Mm-hmm. Like Birmingham, we, don't, we couldn't... I think we're just so such better people in our core um, <laughs> that we wouldn't, we wouldn't like subject the city we live in to being a a kind of associate fragment of our shitty, stupid egos, which everyone else does, the, the shitty Liverpool and shitty Manchester people do you that. Know? <laughs> Whereas the wonderful, wholesome, brummy people, you know, we just don't, we don't big ourselves up at all. We're just too good, I think, ultimately, to, to big ourselves up. The irony is superior. There's no in... irony. How can you possibly, <laughs> how can you even dare to see irony in what, in what I've just... In, Oh, Jesus Christ! Yeah. Like, I, I apologize. That is, your real name. I'm, that is definitely, unfortunately, is my real name, mate. I, 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 I yeah, it's a cross I've had to bear, mate. You know, that's yeah, it. Yeah. I it's have never. Superb name. Oh, well, you know, well, that's the thing. Yeah. I, 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 I t- like to think of it is like uh, the the worst best name. You know, it's like yeah, I mean, for right. comedy, for comedy, it's like before you even get out on stage, you're like winter. Phone, well, I can't yeah, pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, they go, yeah. I, I was already switched off with the winter bit. You it's know, like and, you to a compare mm. no matter how well you behave as a human being will always be a diva yeah yeah because of this stupid name of yours where we're looking at you going oh how do you like to be introduced just my name oh just your name <laughs> oh fine <laughs> what else do you want fucking gold microphone you prick yeah. <laughs> uh, like, uh, <laughs> luckily luckily because of the lockdown now i can bring my own gold microphone with me now which oh, is yeah, nice yeah I've got one of those cool gun ones, which, you know, everyone will love me for, you know, that's yeah, it. Like, yeah, oh yeah. God, this is great. You know, that they'll, uh, they'll really warm to me <laughs> yeah. with that, uh, with everyone losing their jobs. Kevin, Kevin Hart had a gold microphone yeah. and then, and then opened up his show by trying to be relatable to him. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like this is so anyway, it. guys, you know, when you no, we don't Kevin, uh, <laughs> yeah. your microphone yeah. is worth more than my entire salary, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. Oh, what salary anymore. But yeah, that's funny. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, it's tough. must be really tough. You know um, when you're in public and someone almost touches you and, yeah. and then you have to call an ambulance? Oh, wait, no, that's just rich people. Sorry. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we assume we can catch poor, uh, yeah, yeah. but we can't. Um, no, I'm sure he's a lovely man. Billy Connolly is actually my gateway into stand-up as well. I think he's a lot of people because I think for comedians, he is he's one of these people, I think there's a few of them, who are simultaneously hugely popular and mm. brilliant. And like for a comedian, I think people have to be brilliant and Billy was mm. and I remember as before I started comedy really disliking most comedians yeah. like, like that I saw on telly yeah. just not liking them at all 
I think most mostly because of a, a deep envy yeah. or a feel a feeling that I'm muscling on on my my racket yeah. of making two people in my life laugh. Um, <laughs> Billy Connolly was so good that I think he he kind of taps into something. Well, you, when you listen to it, right, there was something about the way he constructed a, a joke that y- you would get to the punchline before him, but he would uh-huh. make you think that you had thought of it yourself. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like that. Kind like, of. like I was like, and you're like, oh. I know this, I'll, of course. And then it came. It was like a, it was like a, a callback to something he hadn't even already said yet. Do you <laughs> know which? Very deep and profound uh, analysis of Billy Connolly. I mean, I, I just personally yeah. liked how he used to say "fuck" quite a lot <laughs> uh, when I was a young man. But you, you of course were deconstructing his his uh, his joke structures and going, "Oh wow, Billy. this is true. This is true. Oh, I've written a book on it. <laughs> is this comedy or jazz, Billy? I can't tell." Um, whereas I was like, "Did you hear him say fuck?" And then mm. I swear he said bollocks afterwards. Yeah, it was great. I was so happy when I heard those words. <laughs> and, and like, do you, do you know what you're yourself, right? So in school, you heard that. What, what year were you in when you heard, first heard that? I believe I was in year eight, which would have been the second year of senior school for me, which okay. I'd have been like twelve. Oh, twelve, right, right. I think, and yeah. uh, I think I was aware. I might have been aware of Billy Connolly before that. I think my mum and dad had a, like a VHS tape. Yeah. of Billy Connolly where he said fuck I think a hundred times in one hour which <laughs> I didn't think he could do any better and then I saw his next bit and he said fuck 124 times in one hour and I was like he fucking pulled that one out of the bag yeah. didn't you Billy that's, that's incredible so I kind of must have had a vague understanding my, my kind of early comic, comedic influence I would say it like things like Red Dwarf my parents always watched that and Billy Connolly The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy I fucking loved and like these, these are the sort of early ones but then I, that tape I think that, that World Tour of Australia say, I think cemented it all for me because it was mine it sort mm. of belonged to me and so I could I could listen to it over and over and over and over again as as you did I don't know if you did that when you were a child mm. do you remember when people experienced a piece of media more than once yeah do you remember that brilliant amazing like you, yeah. you'd listen to a piece of music several times <laughs> uh, yeah sometimes even even in double figures, you'd listen to the same tune. Whereas nowadays, people just like give me the next fucking wave of shit. Um, I'm already bored of the thing I'm currently enjoying. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like like you know when I when I was a kid, it's exactly the same. It's like you know you're played like uh, the same game, just try and get a better score on it. You know, it's yeah, like, look, yeah. oh, I'm just gonna play this. Oh, because just... it, it was like your only game. Yeah, I had like on my snares, I had Street Fighter Two, and I think. I had NBA Jam, and because games cost fucking sixty fucking yeah. bastard pounds or whatever the fuck they were, which was back then sixty pounds back then was actually four hundred eighty pounds <laughs> in today's yeah. money. Yeah, right. So you had to save up until adulthood to purchase a SNES game. Yeah, and you just you just play the absolute bollocks off it. Like, yeah. I mean, now I've got this. You know, I've got millions of brilliant games for a pound for three years. Yeah. And, you know, I still play them in that. But once they're done, they're kind of done. And, yeah, it's like wringing the juice out of stuff, I think, is something that people probably never have to do ever again. Apart from, fr- probably, ironically, from actual fruit, um, as that becomes more and more <laughs> scarce. <laughs> in, the, in the post-Brexit dystopia, yeah, people get will be well back into wringing actual juice from yeah, actual fruit that's it. while watching whatever we want and playing whatever we want and listening to whatever we want in perpetuity. Yeah, um, it'd be a very strange experience, really. We we'll just need fuel to watch more content, isn't it? Really, exactly. that's all we'll need. Exactly. God, yeah, food is just a, a means of maintaining our <laughs> attention. Uh, essentially, ability. essentially, we're just fueling yeah. our eyes at this point, aren't we? Really, that's yeah, all yeah, we're doing. Much. Yeah, it's appalling. I can't stand it personally because I'm still. I've got. I'm a bit old now. I'm 36, so I've got. Weird, I think you're similar, aren't you? We yeah. were in that weird zone of people who existed both before and after the internet. Like I remember when people used to say, "Ah, oh, have you seen this?" And they'd be talking about like a film or something like that, and you go no, and they oh, you must watch it, and you go okay, I'll do that. Yeah, that'll be fine. That'd be two hours well spent watching that film. And nowadays people go oh, have you seen this? And you go no, and then they go well, it's going to take you seventy hours to watch. <laughs> to watch, so that's like two working weeks of your yeah. life will have to be spent catching up on this series that yeah. I personally have watched, but you have not, yeah. in order for us to have any kind of future relationship <laughs> or shared experience you will have to spend 70 years watching this thing that i've also seen jay you've uh, you, you've just yeah. solved a, a riddle for me i was wondering oh, yeah. why i have no friends 
And this is the main reason now I have no friends because I have to put, as you say, 70 hours of work into just nurturing that yeah, relationship. Yeah. And I, I don't even I don't even put that much work into my actual, you know, physical and like, you know, emotional relationship with my wife. Exactly. 70, exactly. Hours. <laughs> 70 hours. 70 hours. I think you're cra- grasping at straws as to why you don't have any friends. I think. Uh, thanks, Jay, for just ruining had, that, that enigma yeah. that I've just made up there. That's great. You just yeah, I yeah. solved the riddle and you just smashing me back down there's my self-esteem gone i mean i was just no, pulling myself out of this that. lockdown I just, mean, I just mean to make a really happy joke about wives meaning you don't have any friends anymore oh well okay I'm, <laughs> I'm, okay oh now it now i've of got a second reason have friends with winter you are a married man this is fish. true this yeah. is true yeah i, I can be on um i could be on fucking jim davidson show <laughs> this is very true this is very true but yeah. like so i uh yeah i mean well it just that's another reason then okay um that's another reason to be married <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah get rid of all those friends yeah, yeah that's Gross. true that's true i mean yeah, yeah. weighing you down when someone tells you something as well i, I don't know about you right when someone tells you something about th- th- this show everyone gets their phone out and then like they, they i'll just put that into the notes and then like sometimes you pretend to put it yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, oh. oh yeah i'll yeah. do that yeah i'll watch yeah I'll cut, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, it's it's appalling. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know if it's true because I quite like. I get a sick, perverse joy from from imagining that everyone's totally awful and mm. I'm brilliant. Mm-mm. I don't know if you're the same, um, but I really <laughs> enjoy doing that. But I've actually found, like, um, uh, I should have said the thing I was going to say before I deconstructed it. I've learned that about myself just now. <laughs> um, but uh, it's what I was going to say is, you know, people now they don't actually converse about anything at all anymore. They just exchange. Like, have you seen this is? Mm. Uh, yes, I have. No, I haven't. Uh, oh, you've got to. Oh, okay, I will. And that's that's all. Com- that's like ninety nine percent of conversations yeah. now, is is that little dance. Yeah. But what I've noticed actually is is from talking to young people, sort of by mistake or whatever, outside gigs, or, or mm. is they're actually all really quite thoughtful and interesting people who have got such a wider reference base of what reality is. Uh, that they're able to sort of uh, formulate ideas and enjoy your ideas in a way that I've never previously experienced when I was their age. So mm. I, I have this worry that there's this sort of uh, dichotomy at play, if that is the correct word, mm. where culture itself convinces us that everything must be completely awful and all people must be terrible, at the same time as that being absolutely not the case. And actually, everything's wonderful and people are great. I don't know if I've uh, been in lockdown too long or not. <laughs> I think I think you're I think you've you're spot on. I think you've I think that you, we're both at that age now when we're going to go. No, no, all this stuff that's being pumped into my head is abs- utter rubbish, and all the other stuff is like yeah. you know the people are actually inherently good if you just give them a chance in yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in in many different situations. But unfortunately, it's not what the you know the media or or culture society pumps into your head because it doesn't work for them it doesn't make them money it doesn't create a, create a lack or a, or a fear to to herd people in one direction or the other quite yeah. right mm. um it's strange isn't it it's weird because i mean it's weird what we're doing right now mm. what we're, we're doing right now is we're having a conversation so that your audience doesn't have to bother doing that in real life <laughs> they can instead just sit and listen to us have a conversation and be like well that's my conversation had for the day yeah. uh, back to netflix or whatever but people love that. What's great about podcasts, and I think this has been said before many times, is they're very, very popular. And all they are is people talking and having kind of like just natural freewheeling conversations mm-hmm. for the most part. And it's, it turns out now, after all this time, that that's actually brilliant and what we should be doing all the time anyway. And all the stuff the media has tried to make over the years is all kind of so, like on a sort of deep level, so soulless and useless and pointless that just simply a couple of people having a chat is is worth more of people's still I spend more time listening to podcasts probably than I do watching any television or films or whatever just because I think it's a better thing to do and it's strange like where can you imagine now like I was thinking this only t- yesterday I believe so this is a really fresh thought exclusive to your podcast you're very welcome <laughs> like I only this is a day old thought that you're getting right now completely fresh <laughs> and probably as a result, um, uh, uh, poorly constructed. But and now I've forgotten it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what was it? It was. Uh, it was the fact. Yeah, you know how they used to do interviews in the newspaper with with a famous person. You know, and then someone someone would sit with them and have a chat with them, hmm. and then they would quote them 
like every you know they will quote like maybe two paragraphs worth of yeah. what they said over the course of two hours and say so, there you go they said this and here's here's the interview and it'd be like a big feature in a in a weekend supplement in the, in the newspaper or something yeah. and now you'd look at that and you go oh can you just record your conversation and i'll listen to that and it yeah. will be 10 hundred million times better than your shitty fucking article that gives us no sense of this human being whatsoever beyond the few quotes you've decided to give us. Exactly. Like, because it's just so not as good. And like, you watch like Parkinson or something, or, you know, he was great and all mm. that. And those those things are still good. I'd probably rather listen to a podcast featuring someone who I thought was really good than see them be interviewed on television because that would be just like something we'd be missing from that. It'd be too staged and whatever no you're right no i totally agree with you i mean i i okay then your opinion on on like the the uh vodcasts you know the video podcasts i mean I, I get why people do them i've done one because i tried in vain to start my own podcast a few weeks ago i've done one episode yeah the fat penguin podcast be nice. one of the four viewers is basically the only reason i would have video in a podcast is is so you can make little clips of it put those clips out as a means of advertising that podcast to a wider mm. audience but the actual idea of sitting and watching people do a podcast is, is kind of gross I'd, I'd much yeah. rather just listen to it like my favorite time to listen to podcasts as i imagine in half the countries or at least the podcast community is is when you're on a commute somewhere mm. on the train yeah. and you're bored or whatever and having a podcast on is a little bit like having company and it makes the time pass very very pleasantly the idea of kind of just sitting and listening to a podcast to the exclusion of anything else is a bit strange to me. I would like like just sit on the couch and listen to a podcast. <laughs> Do you know there's I something that creepy the about that, isn't there? Yeah, there's, there's something that'd be really like, creepy. This guy is is like he's teetering on the edge of something terrible. Yeah, yeah. he he's then, he's got a shrine of some kind at home, um, of uh, potentially hair. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Mm. it's made all out of his own hair. Yeah, um, and it's a sculpture of hair. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. What what's that? It's hair. <laughs> oh, back away slowly. You know, or, yeah. Uh, you you really it. shouldn't 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 make it. You know, a little tip: don't do a shrine if you live in a shared house. You know, and like you know, in <laughs> yeah, the sitting yeah, room. Yeah. Don't put it in the sitting room. Put that in your room. Lock the door. We don't want to see that. <laughs> yeah, could, could you t- could you do the dishes? No, I'm listening to a podcast. Surely you could do them both at the same time. Yeah. Absolutely should, not. <laughs> should 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 I have knocked first before I came into this room? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't you see I'm busy listening to two people have a conversation? Oh, um, yeah, no. So the the point, yeah. So the video podcast is a bit like like who would actually sit and actually watch a video podcast? I don't know. Yeah, I I, um, I really find it. I find it like you said. You said I find uh, watching a vodcast gross. It's yeah, like yeah. it's like it, it's kind of just it's like. All it's all forced, and then no one is really listening to each other. They're just looking at themselves, trying to be hilarious. You know, look, we're having so much fun. It's just so. Forced. Are you talking about Zoom? Are you, like oh. people looking at their own. Well, th- well, both of those. You know, that sort of right. like that. That even when they're sitting in a room doing a podcast together, it's all kind of no one talks like whatever you're saying there. You know, it's not an actual um two-way conversation it's just like oh yeah look i'm funny now oh look i'm funny oh, too see. you know what i mean it's like i find that the, this audio method you know is just so much more you know connectable and accessible well there's something a, a lot nicer about it isn't it mm. i find like i haven't at any point during this podcast felt self-conscious whatsoever mm. uh whereas if um if someone like you know i don't know because i'm you're old like me i'm old mm. Fucking, if someone rings you up on a video call mm. now oh, yeah. because you can, don't you just think, you fucking shit, horrible bastard. Like, I was, I don't mind talking to I'd let someone on the phone. It's fine because I can kind of be, I can slouch or whatever. I can laze around. Mm. I can do other things. I can ignore them a bit if I want to. You know, you can, but on a video phone call, you just have to stare at them and then you're looking at yourself and go, oh, I don't look very handsome, damn it fuck's sake yeah. and it's just a, it's just a gross kind of experience for me anyway I find it far more nice to have a conversation with someone just in audio form yeah. and but, so the, like... but, the, but the children obviously these children that yeah. keep on popping up you know I think they're way more like it's just what they do they're way more comfortable filming themselves and being yeah. like turning themselves into media constantly Yeah. whereas I'm not like yeah. just I think because I'm old Ta- use this analogy before it's you know when Chris Moyle's went on to tv 
Uh, oh, he is the fat one. Isn't yeah, he? that's right. From yeah. was it Radio One he was on, and like he he went onto TV and yeah, it just yeah. it ruined, kind of nearly ruined his career. Really, everyone was like, "Oh, we loved." Oh, and yeah. they saw him like, "Oh no, this is." Yeah, we don't yeah. want to see this guy. We love to hear him. We don't want to see this. Yeah. This what he does in. Yeah, like, like John Peel was not like a pleasant looking human being, was he? Like, and it's not not to shame people for not being photogenic, but but yeah, there is a there is a thing with the telly. It's like people just like looking at people they want have sex with I think a lot of the time yeah maybe and maybe. like um, and like your moils and people like that but then as well it's like a different it's a medium isn't it like um, it's like a thing with comedy where you got you know you can be a, they say oh you can be either a writer or a performer and they say that you know because they don't know a great deal about comedy <laughs> I have heard that yeah. uh, you can be one of two binary things yeah. in this amazing oh. fucking landscape of creative genius. Yeah. You can only be two versions of, <laughs> of whatever. Yeah, yeah, you know. But the but the, the point is, is like is like say you are a writer, so you, yeah. so like you focus a lot of your efforts on on the way you put words together, and that. Yeah. And if you're more of a performer, you might be thinking of facial expressions and and kind of body position and, and all this yeah. sort of stuff very different kind of things that create a very different aesthetic and so if you like chris moyles become an absolute master of the kind of audio sphere yeah. what what can i do by talking into a microphone to mm. a bunch of people who are listening to me and then you just throw them into this world where they've got no fucking sense of like being presentational in a visual sense yeah. like i'm sure chris moyles could have learned to be better Mm. on telly but it's a skill like anything else like like to, to have stagecraft in the, in a purely physical sense which i think like people like you know terry wogan yeah uh managed he got there didn't he yeah big time he was he was radio and tv and and he had he had presence on both didn't he, he, had, pre, he had screen presence yeah um, i think i think that that too that i love that binary thing is like we well, can only be a writer or a comedian well really yeah. you're both things aren't you really and you you have to do the physical and the yeah, yeah. performative and or they go are you a comedian or are you an entertainer uh you can, <laughs> how can you separate those two things you yeah, know yeah. it's like they're they're so they're welded together you know it's just yeah, yeah. It, it, they're, they're, the hardest thing about it uh, you know com, com, being a comedian is like the fact that you have to learn all these things at once to yeah. get really good and to pe for people to really get on board you know otherwise you're like okay well I've, you know you're, you're spinning plates at the beginning aren't you can go oh no okay that didn't go well that didn't go well and then yeah. after a while you can just go right okay i'm doing most of the plates okay that plate needs a bit more work <laughs> do you yeah, know what yeah. i mean uh, well i think what ends up happening with most most comics to a certain or of a degree is they work at, it's like that finding your voice thing they, they mm. work out what it is about them that is entertaining yeah. to, to strangers yeah. and then they focus in on that yeah. and, and get better and better at being the thing that they are mm -hmm. and then they become essentially kind of their own sort of the only source of their own product which is the ultimate what you want as a comedian is to be yeah. like people can only get my comedy from me. That's yeah. what you want to end up at. Absolutely. You can't say that I've got there at all, but like, that's what you'd want. And so like, if you're obsessed, if you're somebody who writes brilliantly and say isn't naturally that great at fucking leaping around the stage and doing impressions or whatever, if you just fucking keep writing brilliantly, you'll end up being so good at that. that it won't matter that you can't fucking jump around the stage like an idiot. And vice versa, if you get so good at performing or whatever, but like you say, it's not a binary. There's people. What I love is they go, ah, oh, you can only be a, a writer or a performer. Mm. And then I go, well, could you just watch um, Will Franken for more than 10 minutes and mm. then you'll see that you can actually be both yeah. to an extremely high level uh, very easily. Well, not very easily. <laughs> he, he does it very easily, the yeah. absolute bastard. But like, you know what I mean? There's no fundamental binary there. But, yeah. but I definitely think people lean certain ways. Like you can tell that if you've got a natural talent for one thing or the other. And then, like, you get this thing, I think, sometimes... It doesn't matter what you're good at. It just matters that you kind of commit to it because if you're one of these people who's really good at one thing, but then you get really hung up on the fact that you can't do something else and then put all your energy into being good at the thing you're not actually that, really that good at, then it's kind of a, a waste, I think, like it seems. It just, you know, get really good at being you. You and, spread yourself uh, too thin, haven't you, really? You've lost yeah. the, the, the path. You've lost the, you know, don't don't basically don't don't give up hope on on you yeah. you still got that that's it and, and, um, and comedy as well i mean like this final point you know just just in practice for mm. uh you know when people care about my opinions uh, like, <laughs> uh 
is the uh, so one of the most important things for a comedian to have, in my opinion, is to be comfortable on stage, or if their act is to appear uncomfortable, to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That being comfortable is like a huge thing, like that just transmits to an audience. Like this guy isn't nervous; he's happy where he is, he's doing his thing. Audiences really pick up on that, yeah. and they really warm to it. And it makes them all relax and makes it easier for them to laugh. So I would like focus on what you're comfortable doing mm. is, is a good way of getting to that place on stage of being comfortable. Whereas if you're there going every day going, oh, I need to be like Lee Evans when you're not a performer mm. naturally. And then you just uncomfortably perform a load of shit. Yeah. You're, you're already you're cutting yourself off from the thing that, I think will allow you to blossom into what you you really should be, uh, which is the moment you become comfortable on stage is the moment like your mind sort of starts working like it would off stage and yeah. all of the stuff you'd like to say just hits you in a sort of more natural way and you know then you end up being uh, a sort of better version, a truer version of yourself on stage. So go for comfort first. That's what that's my big yeah. advice. What makes you comfortable on stage, and then do that. Mm. and then allow that comfort to then inform the rest of your artistic choices. Yeah, so this is going back to like, you know, when you first heard the tape um, from Billy Connolly, right? Yeah. So but were you in drama? Were you mad into drama as well? Or... No, no, I was not at all. I am, um, what did I want to do? I wanted to be a psychologist when oh. I was young, uh, when I went to uni and that. I just thought that'd be a good idea. Then I did a degree and what I learned from my degree is that I didn't want to be a psychologist. Which right. Is invaluable, invaluable, well worth £15,000 <laughs> to know uh, that I did not want to do the thing mm. that I'd told myself I wanted to do. I made furniture for a while. I started my own little business making coffee tables straight out of uni. And that was really nice because I was in control of my own life. But throughout all of this, I had this kind of nag, nagging mm. bit of myself that wanted to be someone who did stuff on stage for some reason like i was never interested in drama when i was a kid i really wanted to be a musician when i was younger i wasn't very good at making music which is unfortunate if, if that's what you want to do so i kind of tried for a bit you know djing and making electronic music and stuff but never really made anything that i thought was worth playing to other human beings but comedy was kind of like second in that tier of like i'd love to do that as well i love people like bill hicks and that and i thought fucking hell, imagine being like one of those people yeah. who could just get on stage and make a bunch of people laugh. I was a comedian in my soul, yeah. like hanging out with friends, always like just trying to make people laugh. I think what well, it kind of fell into place weirdly just by um, like I saw an advert in a in my local art centre's pamphlet for a comedy course, and then that was like the little thing that said, "Hang on a second, you can just do a course in stand-up comedy." Mm. What? I thought you had to be a magic human being. And then when I did that course, it taught us like bits and bobs, you know, that, mm. to help us. Like it's James Cook's course. That's what I thought. If, if yeah. You know him, yeah. yeah. Wonderful dude. Yeah. Uh, very funny. Very good course. The course, while he did teach us some good little pointers in how to like write jokes and do like stagecraft and that sort of stuff, really the big thing that course did was just teach me that comedy, you build it from the ground up. You yeah. start off with five minutes and then you do that and when you get good at five minutes then you get 10 minutes and then yeah. maybe you get a tryout in a club and then maybe they pay you and then download and then you do lots of gigs and then mm. maybe you do a whole show at Edinburgh you can do an hour mm. and then maybe you know all the way down the line like it's a 10 15 20 year journey yeah from starting out to being one of those famous people that you think is magic as soon as I learned that it was like a switch that was like oh I'm going to be a comedian then no worries right. that's fine Right. No, no doubt whatsoever. It's like now that I know you build up to it, I felt confident that I could. Like I wasn't into drama when I was at school mm. or anything like no, no sort of sense of that. But I mm. loved performing to my friends. Yeah. It's weird. It's like I think my friends were like the main. They're the only people I really cared about mm. making laugh. So the idea of an audience of like yeah, who really cares about that? 
Did you okay. have that thing like you know when you were like about to meet your mates outside the uh, outside like the the school and you'd be like right okay I've got this, uh, this idea of a story or like this thing happened <laughs> and you'd like kind of kind of sneakily rehearse it in your head before you got like to the group you know like here we go oh lads this happened you know like just and yeah. it just go full bore at it you know and then you'd have callbacks within those little stories you're like oh you, before you even knew what a callback oh, was look at you you know it's like that I like and just and then like you know little in jokes with that basically like, and and have and do that it was great fun man yeah. I, before before I even knew what that was, you know, you just I was like, because I was like, always wanted to be the, like yourself, probably, always wanted to be the funny one of the group yeah, yeah, and just yeah. messing about and being stupid, like, and and then so that I would have to rehearse it, and oh, you know, that was it. That was oh, all. interesting. I certainly didn't. I don't think rehearse my anecdotes when I was, hmm. a kid, but I told them so many times yeah, yeah. that they effectively became rehearsed. Brilliant. Like I'd be one of those people if I heard a good joke, like my I'd be like right. My next week is sorted because I'm going to tell every fucking person I know <laughs> this brilliant new joke I've heard, and I'd be really just excited to tell them it. And like same with like with a good story or whatever. Mm-hmm. When I got a bit older, I had some better stories, and I'd be at like parties and that, and like yeah, I'd tell yeah. certain stories that people would like, and I'd be like, right, that story is good, so that's part of my social repertoire now. Yeah. When when will I next get to do this story <laughs> in some social context? like that and and so i was probably like an absolute fucking nightmare for most most of my friends with a fucking yeah. jay's doing his fucking mushrooms in the woods story <laughs> and for, heard it a million times and what uh, it's funny one thing i did actually notice about myself from doing stand-up is before i was a stand-up i was quite socially needy like i mm. quite needed to be the center of attention and i needed to make people laugh and all this sort of stuff not to say that that's all i did in my head, like I'd be like, that's what I want out of like social engagements, like going mm. to a party. I want to tell some stories, yeah. and make get some laughs and stuff. And then when I started doing comedy, it was like I just got that. It was like I, I fixed that bit of myself yeah. by getting a huge dose of that exact thing. Like the way I describe comedy for ages, it's like basically for someone like me, it's like you get to be the person telling your stories at the table in the pub for 20 minutes and no one gets to interrupt you and tell their shitty stories <laughs> <laughs> that's how i saw it is yeah. like you know I, like because there is that bit of and it's a terrible bit of my personality or ego but there was that bit of me that like if i was telling great stories at a pub or something and then someone else chimed in i'd yeah. be like ah prick, <laughs> fucking i was in the limelight yeah. that's what i love yeah. And and then when I started doing comedy, and it's like you just get a big hit of that, like yeah. a big dose. Yeah. Uh, then all of a sudden, socially, I was way. I assume so. Anyway, my friends would probably beg to differ, but I, I think I became way more relaxed socially yeah. and way less needy, which is a good thing. Yeah, for sure, man. Was it like a? So yeah. you had a, a a gig at the end of that that workshop then for the com- that, that, oh, sorry, yeah, comedy it was course. So good. And what was your first joke you wrote? My first joke was. So this is the problem with my first set is is it was like a monologue. It wasn't a series of individual bits and jokes like yeah. like what is typically more effective on the club circuit. It was mm. this kind of whole linked monologue about being self-employed. And my first line was, Hi, my name is Jay Handley yeah. and I'm self-employed with a little bit of the tone of like an Alcoholics Anonymous meme. Mm. And then I'd say it's, it's hard being self-employed. Probably the, the hardest thing about being self-employed is getting out of bed and that was my first line <laughs> and it wasn't particularly good but it was so truthful and honest because the whole set was basically about me mm. being this lazy and like lazy self-employed person who mm. loved being self-employed because i was basically like d- dusting around all the time yeah. and having a great time because i was at my own boss and so my whole set was based on that and that was my first line and it and i think um i said something like you know i make furniture out of wood very much like Jesus yeah. and I've I had long hair and a beard or shaggy hair and a beard and everyone's like mm-hmm. ah Jesus and then I do like my pose which still weirdly yeah. like I still do that fucking material but differently worded <laughs> do a cheap Jesus joke to get the audience on side before I ruin yeah. our relationship with the rest <laughs> of my material um, but like but yeah so, so it was like it was all linked and that first gig went so brilliantly well yeah. because I thought at the time I was a prodigiously talented stand-up comedian mm. who didn't need to learn how to do it at all and instead would be brilliant at it from the very first gig. And what turned out to be the case is that it was actually because everyone in that audience was a really nice person yeah. and really supportive of yeah. the brand new shit comedians who were trying their best to be funny. 
and so I had like this amazing gig and it was like I was so happy with myself and then I had another gig on an open <laughs> VIP mic circuit which went really well as well oh, you know not great. playing my own trumpet but that actually I don't know if you ever did Donna Scott's gig in Northampton we are most amused um, yes I did yeah yeah lovely lovely open mic gig and I did that and that went really well and then everyone like Donna was going oh my god that was only his second gig oh my god wow that's incredible mm. and then Neil her, her, her boyfriend I think was going ah oh, you're a bastard how could you be that good at second gig and I was like my good god I am so brilliant this is immense I've just started doing comedy I'm already probably TV ready <laughs> I'm so fucking awesome and yeah. walking around oh, brilliant this is great and then, <laughs> and then I, my third gig yeah. was in Tenbury Wells for a man called Rosie. I don't know if you ever did oh, any yeah. of Rosie's gigs, yeah. but his gig in Tenbury Wells was in this pub where no one knew comedy was going to be happening. Oh, brilliant! And then he would he took a karaoke microphone, like a, I think oh. I'm pretty sure a child's karaoke yeah. microphone yeah. set, and put it on the pool table. I was watching the show. I think I was in the first half or something like sick in the first half of everyone doing five minutes and everyone was like bombing hideously like mm. because the the audience didn't give a shit about yeah. what was happening to call them an audience would have been a bit much really so everyone's dying and i'm there watching people like just eat their balls on stage and I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking in my head wow it's a, it's a good job i'm on oh, because yeah. it's, it's tough to have to go through this shit but yeah when I'm on, they'll laugh and they'll yeah. have a great time and they'll be able to say they, they saw Jay Handley before he was famous the next week. Uh, <laughs> and so I was all just waiting to go on going, well, I mean, it's fucking hell. This is, uh, it's unfortunate some people don't have the gift, but luckily yeah. I do. Yeah. And then I died probably worse than anyone had <laughs> until that point. Oh, I got no, zero laughs That's apart funny. from like my best joke at the time, joke about looking like Jesus yeah. or something and then doing the pose. And for that joke, one person in the whole audience went, ah, like that. And that was the whole, that was their laugh. <laughs> it wasn't a ha-ha. It, was, oh. it wasn't even a ha. It was like a ah, like that. That was the only noise the audience made for my whole five minutes. I genuinely, like, to this day, think I had post-traumatic stress disorder after that gig for a, a period of time because I'd gone from a place of such an, like, engorged ego <laughs> to being to the everyone knows what it's like every comic knows what it's like to yeah. really die yeah. but no human being knows what it's like to really die mm. until mm. they do really die oh. and that feeling i still don't think apart from like bereavement i yeah. don't think i felt anything quite as just my apart, maybe like really like bad acid trips or something yeah. like, like just like just that whole the idea that your entire sense of self can be like torn out yeah you. empty you're empty and then, you? and then handed back to you covered oh. in covered in shit that oh. you did on it <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like and then and then god or whoever goes yeah. that was that shit all over your soul that was yours yeah because because of what you just did <laughs> it's gonna but take you... a while before your soul is clean <laughs> <laughs> that like, was what it was like think, think about that like lump of shit that you've just like reabsorbed <laughs> back into your soul yeah, yeah. it's like you you can't look away from it for so long you know at the beginning you're like oh that's all i can see that is that is me oh. that is i did yeah, that yeah. i've done this yeah, to myself yeah. it's um, oh mate and then but then there's the thrashing around like, i went through all the freudian stages of like mm. bargaining and denial <laughs> you know it's like that didn't happen and then it was because the audience is, oh, the audience was terrible yeah. fucking assholes. Yeah. But what was really bad is like the people in the second half of the show actually did all right. Oh, <laughs> the comedian, no. so I could even blame the audience. Yeah. Like, and so I was just like, just desperately grasping for reasons beyond like myself that yeah. that could have been as bad as it was. That's it. But it's great. Like I was, I was talking to Darren about this mm. on my podcast, the Fat Penguin podcast. But, Jay Handley, uh, Fat Penguin was really, yeah, it's really good for you to, <laughs> as because I think all comedians yeah. like when we start comedy, it's because our ego has reached a point of distortion and 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 like grotesquerie mm. that we convince ourselves that like, people people need to hear my jokes, yeah. like, but my sense of humour is worthy of a stage. Like we're, it's an awful place to be as a human being, I think, to decide to do stand up comedy on the level of the ego. But then the beautiful thing is stand-up comedy is the antidote to its own problem. Yeah. 
because it it absolutely takes your knees out from underneath you and reduces you to like this puddle basically <laughs> of of self contempt. <laughs> And then, and then that you reform from that puddle very slowly, yeah. and and only only with the uh, the consent of audiences, yeah. which is great. Yeah. It's like you can no longer inflate your own ego as a once you have had it burst by a crowd. <laughs> like that's it. You cannot reinflate your own, own ego after that. You have to now stay in the world of comedy until you die to, to just get little bits of air back into it and keep you going like, and, and, that, and that's a beautiful place to be it's oh, a wonderful place to be it's, to like, have, it's, it's like the primordial you know. soup of, of, of self esteem isn't it that's what it is exactly oh, Exactly. Great. our self esteem as comedians yeah. is, is, is crowdsourced <laughs> oh, no, from, a, so from a disinterested and uncharitable source <laughs> that's, that's, that's where we get it from we, and we never seem to reach the threshold to like you know get the fund to carry on it's just it just constantly just deflating just that little bit yeah, so yeah, you never always, claim it always edging out. and the problem oh. with it is is like no matter how well it goes it you it it, dis, it, it dissipates there's no yeah. you can't have a gig so good that you go well that's it for me yeah. won't won't be doing that again yeah not topping that because it's a dopamine it's a dopamine high it's not um it's a very it's designed designed to be transient yeah. like what we've accidentally done as comedians is stumbled into a bit of neuronal circuitry yeah. that previously was fundamental only to reproduction and, and eating yeah yeah for sure <laughs> like, it was that important yeah and then comedians and people who take cocaine stumbled stumbled into that neuronal pathway yeah and found something that would make them feel better than they'll ever feel, yeah. but also it will be so transient that we'll have to keep chasing it until until the day we die. That's great. I, I love that it. analogy, and I was going to try and top it, but I'm not going to try and top this analogy at all. <laughs> it's it's so like I I was thinking halfway like halfway through your analogy, I was like I know it's like a balloon that just keeps on getting deflated, and <laughs> like and like I was thinking you know we think that the next uh, the next threshold of ego or self-esteem is going to be permanent but we're not trees we don't grow and then form no. another ring do we we no. don't you know that's what it is right no comedians don't have rings that's a very no. beautiful way of putting it we, we remain tiny little saplings that yeah. get trodden on at a moment's notice <laughs> right although i do believe we get more robust i think that's yeah. i think we're being probably a bit hard on ourselves yeah. there because one thing i will say about being a comic is mm. that first death was deeply traumatic it was yeah. like genuinely i think i had some sort of trauma from that and then uh, i think I've, I've had a sh fairly shit gig the next one and then i had a good gig after that at, you'll know uh, rob halden's wonderful juice mm. comedy gig in St stafford which is where you start learning actually that was mm. the point i started learning oh right there's such a thing as a good gig and mm. a shit gig and as an open micer good gigs are what keep you going because mm. that's where you'll do all right if the gig is nice and has a nice energy in the room and mm. like blah 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 you can do all right as a shit terrible open micer and feel all right as in the, in and of yourself and then if the gig's got like 12 people in a pub none of them facing the stage then gradually you become able to go oh well this probably won't go that well or i'll have to do something else to get their attention before yeah. i just pile straight into my act like a robot mm -hmm. like i used to or whatever yeah. God, I used to do that. One, one of the biggest tips I'll ever have, and I used this the other day still, when you start your set as an open micer, say hello to the crowd. Just go, hello. And if they don't all go, hello, back, say hello again until mm. they go, hello, back, and then do a joke. Because if they don't say hello, back, they're not listening yet. Yeah. And if you just could do your opening joke, which <laughs> should probably be one of your best, mm. and they just fucking ignore it, then you, they're like... <laughs> Then, then you're like drowning already, yeah, yeah. and so and I actually I had to use that. I was at Top Secret last it was the last gig before lockdown or something, mm. and it was just a fucking rabble. These these mm. arseholes have been because you know everyone was mental. Anyone who's at a club at the moment is basically has a death wish or mm. is mental. And so the, the the crowd was this rabble, and there was some even more like disruptive people. There. And so I literally, I went, I, I became an open mic again. And I was like, I'm going to do that fucking hello trick again. Mm. And I did it. I was like, hello, like mm. that. Mm. And they were like, mm. <laughs> so I went, hello. And they went, oh. And then I did my act and it went really well. And it was just that right. little thing. 
that I learned as a as a new act to make sure don't assume they're all listening and yeah. assume they think you're great or whatever. You got to get their attention somehow. I think it's great the fact that you kind of stumbled upon your sort of like um, your character straight away. You know, with the Jesus thing. Um, uh, did I? Yeah, That's didn't a shame. like. Well, didn't you? Like, I mean, <laughs> but you know, th- th- when you have your first gig, don't you kind of just go, yeah. "All right, okay, that's the the natural you. That's who you sort of like are as a raw individual." But you try to yeah. shape yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. things off it, and so you had that kind of thing. It's like you know, because like I've got to talk about you know your shows as well, man. You've got you know, you've yeah. as you talk about like you've been in you've been in many finals. We're talking about bad gigs, but you've been in many finals, and you just haven't quite you know yeah, gotten no, to I that end. Really, quite won anything. Yeah, I, I always had a very dark sense of humor, which didn't mm. really doesn't really work too well for that sort of environment i don't think dark sense of humor is it coming from the midlands you have that sort of i that, do think that... the midlands scene um uh definitely me and, me and darren were talking about this funnily enough on uh the jay, jay handley's fat penguin podcast available <laughs> uh, somewhere probably. on all your on all your podcast uh, platforms uh, yeah no, is it's it... not actually oh. I've, 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 i got furious when I found out you had to pay for podcast hosting, so I um I used archive.org right. to host it, so you can download it off there <laughs> via my the Fat Penguin Facebook. Page. Do you want to give the uh, the email the the sort of the website now as well? Oh god, it, I need to actually put it on the website. <laughs> I've done very little to promote my own podcast, but Sorry. yeah, go to jhandley.com and, and that'll have all your, everything you need. Um, but but yeah, so I can't even remember what we're talking about. Like. So we're saying like about um, how the, the Midlands got such a dark, a dark yeah, the sense Midlands. Of humor. Yeah, I was talking to Darren about like the, the, one of the main reasons the Midlands has a dark sense of humor, comedically. This this is mm. is because the Hollybush is our oh, yeah. open mic, yeah. And for people in the Midlands, that's like the only one of the only places, especially it was like you know nine ten years ago when I started, where it was a regular weekly mm. sta- stand up comedy open mic. I don't think there was any other weekly gigs. I think everything else was monthly. And that gig, brilliant, fucking wonderful place, the Hollybush. Dave yeah. Francis, yeah. Uh, give him his shout out because yeah. he's awesome. That gig was populated by some of the fucking most brutally dark, <laughs> sense of humoured people in the, you know, the fucking, in the, the whole of the black country or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were rewarded above and beyond what was acceptable for the horrendous jokes that we were telling by that crowd and became, I think, really, really quite like sort of dark and twisted in in, in some of our comedy. And then, of course, but the thing is, what you do as a comedian, if you want to get good, is you try and travel as widely as you can to get a sense of what all audiences like. And you quickly realise, you know, people at Tunbridge Wells, they're not quite take to your fisting material <laughs> in, the, in the way that a bunch of stoners <laughs> from Kidderminster at the back of Hollybush did. Yeah. Um, and I remember that being, that was an early lesson yeah. when I was when I was like, <laughs> I remember I had this set when I was newish, like about yeah. two years in or something, that was basically just all filth, all <laughs> dark jokes and filth. And it would fucking destroy at yeah. certain places, yeah. especially like stand in Glasgow. I remember yeah. I got, um, I got a round of applause for one of the most brutal lines I've ever written. And like, but in my head, I was like, well, that means that that set is the shit. It's absolutely superb. I'm going to do this everywhere. And then I would do it at certain places. Like I think Bromley uh, Arts Centre. <laughs> and just horrify <laughs> a bunch of middle class, you know, people who, who that, that is not their thing. Yeah. That was never their thing to hear those jokes. And, and like learning that about comedy, I think is so hard. Because I think one of the things that tricks a lot of new acts is we'll start out by being fans of comedy. Mm. And so we watch people who we like. Yeah. And if you like dark comedy, like I like Bill Hicks mm. and, mm. you know, Billy Connolly was fairly filthy. Yeah. Doug Stanhope, people like that. You think they're brilliant because you love them and the yeah. audience in the DVDs loves them. But you don't know that the reason they're doing so well on that stage is because that's all their fans in the audience yeah. who fucking love them. And then doing circuit comedy is this very different type of comedy, which is like, it says, well, you're more of like a plumber who goes in and does a job and yeah, you can do your own thing and all that sort of stuff. But a lot of the skill of being a circuit act or a, especially a compare or something like that is being able to tune yourself into an audience and go, all right, they like this sort of stuff. They don't like that sort of stuff. I know that I like dark, filthy material, mm. but I also know as a professional comedian that, you know, the, the fucking um, Christmas party of the local care home 
Yeah. Like that audience might not necessarily want me to talk about that. And then, and then you have this kind of responsibility of like, are you going to be an asshole who's like, yeah. my art is more important than anything. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scream the word cunt in this old lady's face 17 <laughs> times because that's that's my artistic expression. Or are you going to be someone who who's like a human being and goes, I'm a human being standing up in front of an, other human beings who yeah. have souls and sensibilities and stuff like that. Yeah. And maybe I should treat them with the respect that I would treat someone I was talking to at a bus stop or yeah. whatever. Uh, yeah. and, not, and not spew forth the darkest fucking grizzles from the depth of my fucking yeah. soul then find a, a common ground perfectly answer the next question then jay which you planned uh so, oh, yeah. so <laughs> which is my savant like uh what's the word yeah. clairvoyance. clairvoyance right nice on stage i like to ask a question of all the comics i talk to what do you see yourself as when you're going into a gig like what kind of it could be a trade it could be a person it could be an animal what do you like see yourself as and that like you solve a problem in like in a, in a in particular style what do you mean like, like like you know so you 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 know you like you said a plumber you yeah. know you said like you know you see yourself as a plumber to kind of like fixing a I problem i don't necessarily see myself as a no plumber. no but like as in like that was an analogy you used. yeah but there is there is a point i believe in in your development as a comedian where you have to learn to be a plumber right because if you don't that's a very fundamental skill and like so so my view is the the more you the better you get at being a plumber the better you get at actually being able to do precisely what you want on stage because the skills you learn like i've got this story that i tell quite a lot about roger monkhouse and how brilliant he is actually it was my first ever open spot for highlight if you remember mm -hmm. when highlight existed and i uh basically the compare bombed everyone talked over him and then the first two acts were like fucking just fighting the audience like mm -hmm. trying to get to a punchline to get a laugh and then it'd just be like rabble 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 yeah. everyone talking over him and they'd fight to get to the next punchline get a laugh rabble 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 mm -hmm. rabble, rabble really really just rough fucking noisy junglers style gig and i'm sitting there going fuck my life this is gonna be awful like somehow i had a decent first half of my set like mm -hmm. I, you know i did i probably did my hello trick you know, that fucking amazing <laughs> trick that I've mastered saying hello. But then something happened like halfway through. I said, I think I might have tipped into the more filthy side of the set. Mm. And then it just kicked off at the back of the room. Everything went, everyone's shouting and screaming. I was like, what the fuck's going on? And then left the stage. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, that was, I've never experienced like that level of an audience being kind of uncontrollable. And then Roger Monkhouse was headlining. And I was going, fucking, what's, what's he going to do? Everyone's had this really hard night. And he just sort of walked onto the stage and didn't even look at the crowd, didn't even say anything. He was just like walking up and down the back of the stage, just stroking the wall, like, oh, stroke this wall, yeah, why not? Mm -hmm. Having a bit of a stroke, you know, not even looking at him. And it, what happened is the whole crowd went from being like, rabble, 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 rabble. And then they saw that he wasn't paying them any attention whatsoever. And then they were like, rabble, 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 <laughs> rabble, like that. And then yeah. it was like, to and then, rabble, rabble, rabble. And then there was pin drop silence. And then at, at that moment, you could see Roger, he was like, he heard that silence and then he turned and just did one, like a one liner on the guy in the front row that destroyed him completely. Yeah, great. Round of applause from the audience. Fucking amazing. Like, and then within, genuinely within three, four minutes, he's doing jokes about European fiscal policy or some fucking ridiculously highbrow yeah. thing to rounds of applause from this fucking room full of what was previously uncontrollable cunts Brilliant. and that he did that because he was he was a plumber but he <laughs> he knew the he knew his tricks yeah. he knew what he had to do to get the crowd to a place where he could then do what he wanted mm. and i think when you're starting out you kind of end up you like i have this 10 minutes or yeah. i have this 20 minutes this is all i can do if me saying this at people doesn't have the desired effect, I've got nothing else. And being a plumber learns, learns the, the sort of trick of going, all right, maybe I'll try this yeah. type of material first, warm them up to me before mm. I start talking about fisting or whatever. <laughs> or maybe I employ a slightly different tone or pacing or whatever to control a crowd or, you know, these sorts of things that you mm. learn. And I think by doing the plumbing, by not being an arsehole, not thinking your art is so amazing that, if an audience doesn't appreciate it, it's their fault. Because yeah. it's probably your fault when you're starting out. Almost yeah. definitely your fault yeah. if you're shit and the audience don't like it. And then just learning to to give the audience a little bit of credit and go, all right, I'm going to try my best to entertain you. Teaches you so much more about then entertaining them on your terms 
like five, 10, 15 years down the line. Uh, I think then just like blindly sticking to your guns and calling them cunts for your whole career. That's true. Um, but yeah. like that, Roger Monkhouse is absolutely excellent though. He's, he is so good. Yeah. Great. You just got to pick it up. It, it takes a long time. I know when I started, I was really, because your ego is still there when mm. you start out. I think everyone goes through this period of like, they want to, turn pro quicker than everyone else like you get a lot of people going oh, I'm, I'm i'm full time now i've been going two years and now i'm full time <laughs> uh, yeah maybe you get two paid gigs and you quit your job <laughs> yeah. or you lost your job and now now you're full time or whatever you're not really a full time but everyone's kind of like obsessed with this sort of this thing of like mm. how like i want to i want to win at comedy yeah. i want i want to be like my rank needs to be high or my stats need to be great mm. so people are obsessed with like I turned pro after three years mm, okay. or two years or whatever. I went full time after three years, but I know I went full time about two years too early. I just really, really struggled horribly for mm. two years, but I was kind of pushed into it because I had to leave my furniture workshop yeah. and I didn't, I didn't fancy spending loads of money getting a new one. So I just went full time mm. with comedy yeah. and just about clawed my way over the fucking edge without, without falling into like needing to get a job again. Mm. Yeah, everyone sort of like wants to make it really fast or like fucking get on telly really fast mm. or be pro or really fast or whatever. And it's like after a while, you just, I've personally learned anyway, because I'm, you know, I'm, I was moderately successful as a jobbing professional. Mm. Like I had a salary of sorts and I was perfectly happy with that. I wasn't on telly or anything before lockdown. But what I kind of got to the point with is, is like, yeah, you can, you can worry about, oh, fucking hell, I've only got, 15 years left before I'm not going to be the next Dave Chappelle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you can set these fucking like goals for your, your ego that just ruin the whole experience of being a stand up. And I think it's far better to just train yourself in, cer- in a certain way, learn to cultivate a sense of how brilliant and fun it is to be a mm. comedian, regardless of how successful you are, regardless of how quickly you make it, all this sort of stuff. Like just really, really get to grips with enjoying it because that's a skill in and of itself because it is yeah. quite a it, it's a challenging thing to enjoy because obviously it's an emotional roller coaster extreme highs extreme lows like creativity is a fickle fucking thing mm-hmm. you know you can have a great day of writing one day and then a week of or a month of not coming out of anything and yeah. feeling shit if you don't work hard on like trying to just really enjoy it you know as best as you can i think you're kind of missing missing the fun of it you it's know, gotta it's, be fun yeah i think that the best cure for sad comedians and there are many sad comedians i've always advocated for like like a comedy society that works as a, a office temp agency mm. and so if you've got a comedian who's sad because yeah. they're not on telly or whatever then you <laughs> what you do is you set them up with a, a week or two weeks of office temp work yeah and then you force them to do that and then by the end of those two weeks, they'll go, actually, just the fact that I'm a comedian is so superb. <laughs> I couldn't give a fuck if I'm ever famous, so long as I never have to go back to the office temp work or whatever. Because yeah. yeah. it, it, it's such a, like, even on the very bottom rung of, like, you know, full-time comedy, it's brilliant. It's the best yeah. fucking thing to do. Yeah. Even before you go full-time, like, just the scene of going to places, trying to make people laugh, watching loads of other comedians try and make it like it's yeah. brilliant i loved being yeah. an open micer yeah. so much and then when you become a professional one, one of the big problems with it like you are you owe people like a service now like mm. it's like i said about being a plumber it's like if a plumber comes into your house and like breaks your toilet and leaves <laughs> you are rightly never going to pay him again <laughs> that's, yeah. that's basically what mm. a bad a bad professional gig of which i've done uh, you know a number of times you basically like someone's hired you to be a plumber you've come into their house you've smashed their toilet with a hammer so that no one no one else can shit on it now (laughs) and then you've taken their money (laughs) you've taken like 100 pounds off and gone thank you very much sorry about your toilet uh (laughs) let me know let me know if you've got any more plumbing work (laughs) in a few months time i'd love to come back and do more plumbing for you (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay. no absolutely not we'll never we'll never you'll never plumb this goddamn toilet again yeah that's that's pro comedy like yeah. because you money is exchanging hands but like yeah. you know when you're open mic you can you can break as many toilets as you want no one gives a shit because they're already on a broken toilet like mm. a, an open mic gig is a broken toilet and it's just how are you going to break it 
Like that's all you got to care mm. about. What what kind of approach to breaking this toilet are you going to take mm. compared to everyone else? All the other toilet smashes yeah. on the lineup. <laughs> it's I a could, great I, time. I'm going to say this as well. We've got, we've got, we've got a bit, little bit of time left, Jay. So I'm going to say this, oh, right? I know. Right? Is it like, um, no, if, I was great. No, I think it's, it's absolutely a wonderful analogy as well of like what you shouldn't, <laughs> what you shouldn't do at pro gigs. Just, you know, do your best. Hopefully, you know, don't try anything too new. Just one or two jokes. It's going great. But don't just yeah. shit all over their toilet and then ask yeah, them to pay yeah. you for it at the end of the day. Because it's not your house. I, yeah. I will shit all over my, <laughs> my toilet. If, <laughs> if I'm at the end of the fringe, yeah. I would, that toilet will be, yeah. decimated by my own terrible shits like yeah. by the end of the run because it's my stage yeah other people right. have come in if i lose the audience then that's my fault i don't care it's mine yeah. same with with anything like with your if it's your show it's your show but if if someone's if a promoter's paid you to do a job mm. to a degree i also as a promoter i think you know if, if i buy a ticket to the match i don't insist on the result being what i want you know but i do there is a sense of like you don't necessarily pay the same person twice if they're not for your crowd or mm. whatever. You don't hold it against them, but mm. you just you don't think, well, that's worth a hundred quid again because there's so many other comedians. But you've got to respect the fact that you're not the star of the show. It's not your show. Mm. Someone else has put this show together and promoted it and got mm. all the people to come on the promise of being entertained. Yeah. And so you you wanna you wanna do the job for them. Yeah. You've done five shows. You've done a free comic, free comic volume two. <laughs> you want the truth you can't handle the truth yes. and uh and handsplaining and then of course your final show is that the final show white jesus is and... no, what, what, what's happened there is i haven't updated my website that's correct uh, i've actually done six shows <laughs> oh what's the new what's the new uh, one white jesus 2 oh mate uh, no some... resurrection which i did at last year's end of a fringe oh. in 2019 mm. 2019 i did uh white jesus 2 which great. I really enjoyed. I love that show. It's a great show. Did you you recorded yeah. you recorded White Jesus? Yeah, yeah, I recorded White Jesus one. That's on my website. If people want to watch that, yeah, very good show. I, I really like that show. Then White Jesus two. I will attempt. All I've got really is poor quality audio from Edinburgh. I try and stitch together a uh, an audio version of it because the material for me now is so of that time mm. that what I was talking about that. I couldn't really I, I don't feel like I could re-record it now yeah. like it's just it's just that's what it will be now it'll be like an old audio recording rather than trying to get it filmed somewhere like I did the last one or maybe I'll, I don't know, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll stick it out somewhere I mean they also you know your favourite favorite. your new favourite and his favourite oh, wow. I, I love it so, so which was your yeah. favourite show of those ones I think um, as far as material goes I think White Jesus the one I filmed is still my favourite I yeah. think that's got some of the best stuff I've ever written in it because I think it was all the hardest material I've ever written because it's all extremely offensive I mean it's not it's not designed to be offensive but it, it skirts the line like in my opinion well although not not to maybe some people's but yeah I thought I found it was like the most challenging show because I kind of spent I spent a year writing material that sort of went against what would be known as the sort of status quo kind of moral position of uh, whatever. Yeah, it's I know like what you're saying that. you do. It's not fluffy. Deliberate. It's not fluffy, and it's not just acceptable. Yeah. It's what you yeah. feel in your soul. I like. Yeah, like that. I like that. It's great. And well, so, I, and like, yeah, just to sort of. Um, it was. It was definitely. I was taking the piss throughout. Like, it wasn't. It's not like I was. These are my actual definite opinions. But like comedically, it was. I was trying to say. I, I was. It was sort of inspired actually by um, Joey Diaz, who's a comedian. He yeah. said something that resonated with me, which he said. Uh, comedy is is about saying the wrong thing in the right way so i tried to essentially hold like loads of like the, the blurb for the show was jay handley shares wrong-headed opinions about matters he should probably leave well alone so the, the whole point of it was trying to kind of comedically justify a whole load of really wrong-headed opinions which i found really fun but to extend the question like my that was my favorite show in terms of material i think my favorite ever experience though like of a show was the first one uh, my first ever solo show because it was just a magic year. It was just so fun. Because I'd just gone full-time. Uh, and I thought, fuck, I'm full-time now. So what I'll do is I'll do Edinburgh. And I, I only did it. I did Edinburgh basically as a way of solidifying my 20-minute set. And I was like, right, I, like the 20 is important as a professional. So I'll do 45 minutes. And that should hopefully mean that I've got a robust chunk of material from which to kind of do a decent job on the circuit. And... Um, and it just went great. It was really just a fluke. Like I got this little venue, Dragonfly, 
which was one of those ones where it's like an entry level free fringe venue, but it just happened to work brilliantly for my run. It was like nearly always full. It was a lovely space. It just felt nice in there to do a show in there. Like everyone felt comfortable and happy, which as you know, in Edinburgh, mm. it's not always the case, depending on the venue you get, you might, you might sure. be in some horrible fucking shit, dilapidated old building or whatever, but this was just lovely. And all the staff were great. And I made loads of friends with like people who came to the show and had like a little gang of like, like friends and that, and yeah. just the whole fringe, that whole fringe was just brilliant and exciting because it was my first time doing that length of time on stage so like yeah so as a sort of as a life experience that first show was just like amazing and then as a just as a comedian i think white jesus was probably the best thing i've done uh in terms of sort of our like the material and that and which one did you despise my hardest ones was probably the, the second show was just difficult because like I've got this whole theory about expectation in comedy mm. being like a really dangerous thing. Yeah. And what I mean is like as a comedian, like one of the worst places you can be as a comedian, I think, is expecting a certain result from what you're about to say. Because then you put everything on the audience. You put this whole like burden on the audience to behave how you would like them to behave. And you and that can cut you off from actually reacting to how they're actually behaving like and what i mean is like that that year and i think in 2016 as well so did this my second year i was like i want to recreate my first year i want it to be exactly the same i want it to be full most of the time i want the audiences to be really nice and i want it to be great and it wasn't full <laughs> it was the same venue but it, it was more patchy with audience mm. the show wasn't as solid you know because it was the second show you know yeah. I'd, I'd used up all of my bankable material for yeah. three years of writing and then had to write something new but there's still some old stuff in there it was that sort of learning about like don't if you expect too much then you won't deal very well with what you're presented with yeah because you'll be comparing it to your expectation and that was the same in in 2016 i did like a best of show which in my head was going to be this kind of like announcing myself to the industry for yeah. my greatest and the problem with it was is because everything in my greatest hit show was a hit as it were it was a, a a solid bit of material on the circuit what happened is that i expected the audience to always enjoy it and uh in the shitty edinburgh as you know some audiences sometimes you just have horrendous shows because the audience is flat or the venue's rubbish or you know like you can have there's all sorts of reasons why an edinburgh crowd can take your fucking greatest artistic achievement and give it back to you <laughs> with a straight face and a shake of the head like you know yeah and that was the problem with that year is like i expected every bit of material in that show to work really well because it did like fundamentally did on the circuit in edinburgh it didn't and so every time a bit fell flat i had this emotional reaction to it of oh. like i was expecting something else to happen and and resenting the crowd and being unhappy about it all and and that really fucked up my whole relationship with that show over that that year but then the next year i I wrote a brand new show from the ground up which later formed kind of the backbone of white jesus and that was great because i had no idea how any of that show would go pretty much i previewed it a few times but really i had i hadn't got a fucking clue and so every time i was doing the show for the first half of the fringe run it was like finding out what the audience felt about yeah. it and it was interesting it was right. exciting to see yeah. what their reaction was and yeah. i would play off their reaction and improvise stuff around how they reacted in nice. certain moments and it was so much more free than that kind of stale thing of having like yeah. really polished material yeah. that you expect to go a certain way because that actually cuts you off from properly communicating to a crowd because you you just sit in there expecting something of them whereas in real life you know if you communicate with someone you've got to listen yeah right you've got to react and yeah. like i found that really difficult with with old well worked out material compared to with a brand new show which fucking was totally poorly prepared but just felt way better and like i think made me better as a comic in in general in answering the question of like what do you see yourself as a, as a, as a comic did you well, we talked about plumbers but did you say what you you nailed yourself down to you, you committed to any particular trade or what was it you said no i really don't know 
Um, no. I'll say being a plumber is an important part of becoming a Fair. functional circuit comic. Yeah. But I don't see it as a as an important part of being like finding your voice. Of you, of you, like so, your image of self. My my image. I've got no idea really. I know mm. I've got quite a dark sense of humour. Okay. I know I like being provocative. Yeah. And I know I like. I've got a kind of naughty boy syndrome. I suppose I like saying stuff that you're not supposed to. Yeah. Like. But I find it very difficult to define myself. They're, like other people have said of me, like one guy said, uh, "What's great about you is that you you come on and everyone really likes you, and and they want to be your friend because you're lovely." And then you say absolutely horrendous things, <laughs> <laughs> and I quite like that. I like that. I've sort of been charmingly like I always like to think there's a twinkle in my eye whenever I'm saying anything. Like I'm I'm doing it deliberately because it's funny to say the wrong thing sometimes. Yeah. The idea that I've got. I don't really even think it's up to me. Like, I'm not someone who's planned what my persona is going to uh-huh. be or even gives a great deal of thought to it. I just hope that whatever I am on stage is quite is, is entertaining to people. Yeah. And uh, that will probably change over the years. You know, yeah. I've, like, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be the guy who's like this and that's what I've got to be. I'd quite like, like, my next show is going to be, I think, way more sort of just philosophical than, than it is deliberately provocative yeah and certainly last year's show was way more personal anecdotal stuff than mm-hmm. it was me just sort of going after sacred cows like i did the year before so i quite yeah. like the fact that i can do different things so hopefully that's how i define myself someone who can like uh, metamorphosize a little bit yeah comedically and do what he wants uh, yeah. when he wants rather than someone who has to fit a certain type of caricature caricature or something but like yeah, exactly, without yeah. without being completely reductive now has he's about to be reductive <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you know you may be uh, like this is just i like to just i mean i'm not pigeonholing in any way we all evolve but for the the white jesus with a black heart how's that like you know <laughs> i know that it's a nice quote but it's just like you know i wish someone would give that that'd be a nice quote for you to have on a poster wouldn't it but like <laughs> but as you evolve you know a white jesus with a black heart also a philosopher you know like but as that that comes with like just as we're just growing older and more thinking more deeply about things all that stuff is just percolates and and adds to the act as well so it starts off as one thing and then just that's the the outer shape isn't it and then the rest is just changes within my theory hopefully i don't know if this will happen properly but what i think hopefully should happen is the more i write the less i'll be able to write about anything other than what is authentically me because the more you, you i think when you start out you kind of go oh that will work as a joke that sounds funny yeah that's all right and like you're kind of influenced by other comics and what works for them and stuff like that and yeah and you kind of end up with this kind of like sort of pastiche sort of thing of like lots of little things that work but they don't resolve and what i hope is is that you get to a point where you've written so much of the stuff that sort of works as functional comedy and then you start writing about the stuff that's more personal to you or whatever and yeah. more authentically you and then eventually that resolves itself into the person you are on stage and like makes sense to like makes you make sense overall yeah. it's a hard but i was talking to will mars about this about because mm. it's very hard to be yourself on stage i think because it's such a stressful environment where typically i think you start out like your jokes are like little like the laughs you get are like stepping stones across a river that you might die in. And so fundamentally we, we want 20 minutes of stepping stones to get across a river yeah. without drowning. And then the way I see it is kind of like when you try and do stuff that's more personal, it's actually quite a lot more difficult to make it as funny as, as kind of more by the numbers comedy that you might write when you, when you newer. Yeah. Um, like the, the analogy I came up with is like, you know, when you're breaking a horse, I mean, you must yeah. have broken in a few horses. Oh, many, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm always breaking in horses, so this is why I've come up with this analogy. <laughs> is you tie a rope to the horse and and let it go in circles around you. And then very gradually you, sh- you shorten the length of the rope between mm-hmm. you and the horse until it's next to you. Mm-hmm. And then you can touch it and pet it and like tame it. Um, but you do it very gradually. Uh, if you just rush up to a wild horse, it'll kick you or run away. And I see, I see, 
I see like the self as a bit like that on stage, like mm. your true self is like that that wild horse and your act you're you're trying to pull it yeah. that little bit closer to your act every time and if you pull too hard and you become too yourself or too too vulnerable before you've got the skill to carry it off you can make the horse bolt yeah that's the way i sit in like the more you do it every year i like to think the horse is just getting a little bit closer to me until like however many years it takes i end up kind of riding the, the horse as it were my act is me kind yeah. of um riding myself that's very that's a bit close to uh <laughs> like it's just a very masturbatory analogy that I've mate, with it. mate well in fairness in fairness i think that is probably one of the better uh descriptions of stand-up comedy what a narcissistic onanistic act <laughs> comedy is anyway do you know what i mean you go up there well, it's it is, like it? yeah it is it is but um, i think it's i think it's dressed up in the thought behind it was trying to be very beautiful and in the end it just became a wank joke in the end i'm sorry it did yeah 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 <laughs> that's pretty much and that's what happens as soon as you try and be vulnerable as a comedian you get scared and yeah. then you go penises and vaginas and shit and poo and the audience laugh and you go fuck i got away that one. <laughs> good job i said penis vagina shit poo at the end of that at the end of that personal revelatory yeah. statement otherwise yeah. they would have just stared at me yeah um that was, right, and it, it was beautiful <laughs> beautiful that was beautiful was, it was beautiful it was a beautiful um lead up and then of course you just you have to take the legs from under at the end i like that it's great course, we, we end up fucking something or, or yourself yeah, yeah, you know yeah, it, yeah, it, we, are, yeah. we are basically trying to learn how to have sex with us the audience is just, it's very much um just a, it's just a noise that has to be made to make us feel like we're about to come or something. I don't know. No, we've lost it now. Uh, no, it's, it's no I think it was now. great. I think you absolutely nailed the comedy on, on the head there with what it, what it is as, <laughs> as a beast. Like, what's the next move, man? I mean, if there is one, you're just writing a new show? Oh, my plan is to stay uh, at least two metres away from everybody. Right. And, and, uh, and report any uh, symptoms of fever or, or a dry cough. No, I mean... I hope everything will be sorted out in about by summer. Potentially, maybe the fringe will be on. I don't know mm. if it will be, uh, but potentially it'll be on. And if it is, I'll, I'll be there. And just get back on the horse, funnily enough. Hey, hey little joke there. <laughs> let's get back on that fucking horse and, and do comedy that's again. Because that's, that's all it. I really care. Like, like I said before, it's super fun. I want to. I want to get back to my life, yeah. which I built. Yeah. which was doing comedy all the time and, and having a great time. And that's basically, if I can manage that, then I'm happy. Yeah. Uh, I don't need any any wild um, career success. I, I think it's already uh, great to just do it great. and uh, keep putting out shows. Hopefully my third show, White Jesus Ascension, oh. uh, will live up to the extremely uh, pretentious level of philosophizing <laughs> I intend to do in it. Yeah. Who knows? But, uh, you know, we'll see. Great. Maybe it'll be all right. And where can we find you, Jay? Uh, dot com has my show on it, if you want to watch it. Yeah. And uh, and it should have a link to the podcast as well. Fuck it. I might as well Great. advertise that. Yeah. And do another one, maybe. Who knows? Yeah. Do, man. I'll get you on it. I'll get, I'll get Winter Fernando nice. on my podcast. Great. And we can have exactly this conversation. Brilliant. From my uh, end. And I'll try and Actually, talk your Actually, we could just analogies. do a swapcast. Yeah, that's Fuck fine. Fuck it. We've already done this one. Yeah. I could just put this one out on my podcast as yeah. well. You could just do your um, intro on, on your stranger. Welcome to the Jay yeah, Handley. Yeah. It might sound at times like Winter is leading this conversation. <laughs> but he's such a narcissist anyway. People yeah. would expect that. God almighty. What a prick. Right, what like. kind of guest keeps <laughs> asking the host questions? Yeah. Fucking weird. What a fucking control. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy, 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 uh, windy Fununu or whatever his fucking stupid name is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm sick of getting introduced like that. It really is. It's just getting, get my, yeah, yeah. to get my tits now. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to come, just reduce myself down to one name now. You know, because that would be much more. Oh yeah, just uh, be, acceptable. If you just came out as winter. Oh god, they'd love that, wouldn't they? Mate, uh, I oh, mean, yeah, straight away oh, starting from. Already, I, I think all of my skin has crawled up. And, <laughs> Up else. <laughs> wow just bare flesh now <laughs> that's it that's Gross. it um yeah, but yeah. um yeah it's a good place to start from like minus 50 uh and then like you know ease, ease yourself into the crowd <laughs> uh, but jay oh man thanks for coming on the podcast man it's oh, been real pleasure, fun man. to catch up with you and uh, yeah, yeah. talk to you about your shows and what uh, your analogies are just uh, superb mate 
Oh, thank um, you. I do hope so. And uh, like, so uh, White Jesus, The Ascension, I can't wait to see it. I'm going to watch White Jesus, um, the the first one. Uh, that's on your website, Jay Handley. Yeah, give com. it a watch, man. It's a re- I really was proud of that show. So it's def- definitely worth watching if people want to watch it. Great, man. All right. Yeah, Thanks for coming to the show, mate. Cheers, bro. Take care. And that was episode 90 with the very funny Jay Handley. Jay has just got through his heat for English Comedian of the Year 2021. So go and support him. Go and vote for him. He's an excellent comedian. And go and check his website out to watch his special, White Jesus. He's an excellent comedian. If you ever see him on a fringe, go and check his show out. He's a really lovely guy and a great comedian. And you can find this podcast. We're on Facebook. We're there. We have a page. You can go to Twitter. You can follow me at Winter Dominus. I'm also on Instagram at Winter Dominus as well. That's Winter, D-O-M-I-N-U-S. Now, if you like this podcast enough and you feel like you want to donate, just go to Patreon, type in The Comedy Defect Podcast. I'll donate as little or as much as you feel this podcast is worth. And if you can't donate, that's okay. Just tell your friends about your favorite episode or go to the podcast app and leave us a nice, honest review because it tells people where we are and what we're up to. I'm going to keep this outro short because that was a very long but enjoyable one with Jay Handley for episode 90. Next month in October, we have a very funny Australian comedian, Johnny Katz. And that is the last Wednesday of the month. And we'll speak to you then.